Hello and welcome to the Movie Booker Podcast. It's me, Matt. Hey, it's me, Chris. <laughs> Chris forgot himself there for a second. You're right, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I'm okay. I'm, I'm with it. We've got a special guest, uh, Matthew, another special guest, friend of the podcast, Tom Beasley's back. Back Hello. from um, Green Street. Was it Green Street? That's it. It was football hooligans last time. This time it's something a little bit different. <laughs> You've gone for a hooligan of sorts. I mean, it, I mean, there is some sort of <laughs> infiltration going on. Um, I, yeah. I, I, I imagine if Venom goes down the football, it gets a bit larry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's going to be it's going to be carnage. Uh, pardon the pun, but. <laughs> You're giving the game away, uh, Tom. There, but you, you've chosen Venom to speak to us on this uh, on this edition of the podcast, and um, it's one of those movies that uh, I remember coming out in 2018, critically panned. Obviously, if, if you're listening to podcasts and reading uh, movie magazines and stuff, you'll know that it got a bit of a beating. Um, and it's one we've me and Matthew's had on the list, I think, for quite a long time, and never got yeah. around to tackling. So. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to do this again. Before we go and let Tom let rip, so to speak, on, on why he loves this movie so much, let's do the administration. So Venom on IMDb is always fares better on IMDb, as we know. It's a bit more of a, a reasonable scoring system. I think a lot of the like the viewer scores uh, help to bump it up uh, above, over and above kind of the, the critic score. So it got a good, healthy 6.7, which is... Too high for us normally, um, but we you know we give a little bit more leeway with IMDb. But Rotten Tomatoes is where it's at. That's where we really need to draw our attention because it's a fair old splat on there. The tomato meter is 29%, but the audience Ooh. score is a whopping 81%, which says a lot. That's probably one of our biggest gaps, right? I think I don't know if I've seen a gap as big as that before. It certainly is. But Tom, you know, this is your movie of choice. But why Venom? Why did you want to speak to us about Venom? Well, I remember my experience of Venom really vividly because I remember, um, so I was doing my freelance film journalism at that time, as I am now. And I remember being at the London Film Festival at around the time where the press screening for Venom was. And so I was queuing up with my fellow critics the next day. I hadn't gone along to the Venom screening. Um, and we were preparing for whatever worthy European film about sad people we were going to watch that morning at the festival. <laughs> <laughs> um, and everyone was talking about how terrible Venom was. And I was sort of, so I was kind of braced for this, you know, nonsense of a movie, particularly after the crazy trailer. Um, and so I, I had a friend visiting and we went to see it the weekend it came out. And I remember we turned to each other about halfway through and we went, well, wasn't this supposed to be terrible? <laughs> and we sort of looked at each other and said, I'm so glad you feel the same because I'm having the time of my life with this movie. <laughs> Yeah. And I don't really know what accounts for the way I love my critical colleagues, but they got this one wrong in a big way. And yeah. I don't really know what accounts for that. It really sticks out in my mind. It's one of the first films where the fact that it wasn't like open to screeners beforehand was such a massive thing. It was like, and it's the first I was kind of aware that this this kind of sub world of pre screeners and the fact that you know that they, they normally let people come in and review it first. And then, you know, suddenly this film wasn't able to do that. They, they weren't able to go and give us early screenings and stuff. And it was a really massive thing. There was one UK press screening, and I think it was 48 hours before it came out. Super close. And it, it, it got the alarm bells ringing for a lot of people. And, and I think maybe with that, they were determined that it was going to be awful because it had to be awful. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done such a strange thing. And then, like, I remember my expectations were so low. So, and I watched it and I just totally enjoyed myself watching it, despite everything that apparently happened. I, I have to agree with both of you. I mean, it's one of those ones that I was you know, very sniffy about because I think I remember tweeting people from Empire around the same time and having trying to have an online conversation with them thinking, I think I may have, we had Helen O'Hara on the uh, show way back in like maybe two years ago uh, when this was had been out. And I said, do you think people just, have decided on this film already based on the trailer based on it being not in the marvel universe and the, the you know the absence of spider-man and all the other issues that people were talking about and the effects weren't quite finished for the trailer i don't think and i think people had their minds made up and they were gunning for it even before they had the opportunity to see it do you think that's the case tom um, i think there's an element of that i think it's really interesting with with venom because i think part of the 
the the kind of idea that crystallized it um i mean i think on the empire podcast i think when they were talking about venom was when they sort of debuted their um every day's christmas eve catchphrase yeah when they were because they were talking about how awful the venom trailers looked which they kind of did to be honest yeah. with you um and they were saying you know i think the part of the problem was that everything about this movie seemed to be compromised so mm. it was a story about a spider-man villain but they're not allowed to use spider-man so they've got to find a way around that it was initially sold during the production as being like this r-rated take on the character you know hot on the heels of logan and deadpool and, and things like that mm. and then obviously that didn't end up happening i think it was a 15 certificate over here but it was a pg-13 in the states and so I think there was an element that for a lot of people going into it, they already felt it was, was compromised going in. And so I think maybe, and you know, the film itself doesn't do a great amount to kind of allay those fears. If you wanted an R-rated kind of gritty, vigilante, anti-hero, superhero movie, Venom ain't that. It's a lot of things, but it's not that. And so I think it was in some ways an issue of expectations rather than anything else. Mm. It's so close to being what that though, isn't it? I mean, it's literally a, a bit of CGI blood away from being a, a, a gory <laughs> 18 with some, with some good old F bombs drop, you know, sprinkled in. Cause it, I think it, it tonally, it, it kind of traced the line between like body shock, horror, black comedy and, you know, gore. It's kind of, it wants to be a little bit of everything and it, all it needs to do is just a little push over the edge to get full blown kind of, 18 certificate and I think it would have had a I think everyone would have had a real a, a much more clearer time with it or a much more comprehensive time with it based on the fact that it was going there and knowing what it wanted to do for me it's three films or at least two films say the first half sets the scene and then we get like the last hour or the or the, the, the final part of the last half is where you sit and enjoy the, the, the relationship between that Tom Hardy kind of creates you know with with Venom itself, and the like, like kind of Gollum type thing going on, but with <laughs> black goo. And then that's where you kind of can sit back and go, ah, oh, I know where I am now. This is proper popcorn fodder. To try and kind of, you know, stop this loving, this sort of Venom circle jerk that we've got. <laughs> <is that>? um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is awfully formulaic, right? I mean, from like the characters, the plot, I mean, they, they kind of throw, try and throw a bit of space plot in there at some point but as soon as you see the the characters each of the characters they all fit a very a very well trodden kind of role um mm -hmm. from riz Ahmed's um you know bad guy who could easily be the same bad guy as we've seen on several other films who starts off nice but then becomes bad well it doesn't doesn't stay nice for very long at all to be fair but weirdly i think because there'd been such a rash of brilliant superhero movies that didn't follow those formula <laughs> it stuck out because it was like oh I, this is comfy i don't need to i don't need to feel for the bad guy i can i can just you know he's not multi-dimensional he's just a twat he's an asshole <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think the thing is like you can get away with being formulaic which like i totally agree with everything you said it's it is a formulaic movie you can get away with it if you've got personality and yeah. that's what the MCU did, particularly in its first phase when, you know, it was by, by necessity, it was doing origin stories for all of these heroes. And they are all kind of formulaic. But the thing that made them work so well is that they all have personality. And for everything that, you, you know, people might say about Venom, it's got so much personality. Um, a lot of it comes from Tom Hardy doing not one, but two ridiculous voices. <laughs> um, but there is so much personality to it. There's so much kind of chaos at the heart of it that it works because, you know, it is so formulaic. The first half is a sort of, you know, procedural thing. And then there's the kind of experimenting with your powers bit in the middle. And then even, you know, the third act, which is the old superhero movie trope of fighting a villain who's almost identical to the hero. Yeah. Which you've yeah. seen so many Marvel movies, particularly, um, you know, you could rattle off probably 10 off the top of your head, Marvel movies that have done exactly that. Um, and then of course, Logan did it as well. So that's really interesting how it is so formulaic, but it has this silliness and this mm. sort of personality at its heart. And it came at a time, it came from memory just a few months after Avengers Infinity War, which is a great movie, 
but it ends obviously on that massive down note, you know, the genocidal <laughs> final scene of Avengers Infinity War. Um, I remember writing something at the time Venom came out where I compared it to The Greatest Showman, which was another <laughs> example of the critics just misjudging the mood on something. Mm. Yeah. Um, and the great, so The Greatest Showman was kind of the, the sort of antithesis of La La Land, which was a really great, really critically acclaimed musical that ended on a down note and was very serious. Infinity War ended on a down note and was quite a serious superhero movie. And so Greatest Showman and Venom were both sort of antidotes to the seriousness that had come before. They were both panned by critics, both went on to do amazing business at the box office, beloved by audiences. So in a way, I think there's a real analogue between Venom and, and The Greatest Showman. Uh, and I think they're both really great. You can't quite do a sing-along Venom, though, can you? And that wouldn't necessarily bring the... the oh, I don't know. I think, I think Eyes, Lung, Pancreas could be a top ten hit. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they do need to put this on the stage. There needs to be some sort of <laughs> musical version of Venom. Tom Hardy. So many treats, so it. little time as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it would be great. Everyone <laughs> sings along for Turd in the Wind. It would be fantastic. You you touched on something, Tom, about the casting and you know how they they both. That well, I mean, all the cast is basically playing it as tongue in cheek as possible. But I think uh, yeah, Tom Hardy does. Is, is so watchable in pretty much everything, and even the bad films. Well, <laughs> we've well, seen um, Capone, uh, where yeah. he's kind of thrown that in your face, hasn't he? <laughs> yeah, but he's still he's still um, he's still quite a, an entertaining watch to see him just go to these these extremes. They've, even this kind of role for him, he's still trying to put a little bit of a, a, a quirkiness to it. It's he's really obviously obviously front and center and doing and holding the film up. But it's a shame about Michelle Williams. I don't think she has a great deal to do. I know that's one of the things that was critical criticized about her. And hopefully in the, in the follow up, you know, she might get more of a might get more of a something to get her teeth into. Riz Ahmed again just plays this quite hissable villain who who no one's rooting for and could just see his complete psychopath. Oh two really good good bits of casting for me was Reed Scott from Veep who who uh plays the the doctor, Dr. Dan Lewis, who becomes Michelle Williams's sort of new new love. I think that's fantastic casting because I think he just brings a, a really warm, approachable kind of um, style to that role is because because you kind of want to hate him because he's the he's the new love, but he actually quite he's actually quite a nice guy. And Jenny Slate as well, who plays uh, Doctor Dora uh, Skirth, who, who who obviously doesn't make it to the end of the, the film. Um, I think they both are really nice little bits of uh, supporting actor um, casting there. I guess some of those cast members, Michelle Williams, I'm thinking of particularly, and Riz Ahmed as well. They bring a sort of kind of gravitas to it, though a certain kind of respectability and sort of prestige feel to it you've got michelle williams you know great awards garlanded actor michelle williams delivering these ridiculous lines about symbiotes <laughs> and uh, the, there's the stuff where she's talking about having the power of the symbiote inside her and it's brilliant because it's michelle <laughs> williams the brilliant michelle williams doing this stuff and I think that casting's really smart. And then obviously you mentioned, you know, people like, like Jenny Slate and she's fantastic in this. I think it's really well cast from start to finish. And I think everyone commits to it so brilliantly. Like there's a story about Tom Hardy where the infamous scene in the lobster tank in the restaurant, apparently the, the way that came about was they were filming on that set. Tom Hardy saw there was a lobster tank and he went, I'm getting in that. <laughs> and then overnight, overnight, the production designers came in to reinforce the lobster tank so he could get in it, fill it with fake lobsters so they could do the scene the next day. Yeah. And, and I just love Tom Hardy having that level of just mad commitment to something. And I feel like that's how he approaches everything he does, yeah. um, you know, from the sublime to the ridiculous. But I do think the fact that everyone, everyone knows what film they're in, but that doesn't mean yeah. that they're phoning it in. They're all really trying, whether they're playing it straight as some of them are, or whether they're playing it crazy like Tom Hardy, everyone just throws themselves at it. And I think it's difficult to dislike that because everyone's trying so hard. No one's phoning it in. They're going, oh, let's make a superhero movie and make some cash. They're all going, we kind of believe in this stupid superhero movie. Let's just yeah. make it great. Um, Effects-wise, there's a few niggles, I would say. I don't know, don't know what you think, Tom, but... 
over, apart from kind of like the pacing issues that we've discussed a little bit, how it kind of it, it takes a while to get there, in my in my opinion. But what do you think about the effects? Because it's kind of smacks a little bit of uh, PlayStation cutscenes to me in some places. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think there's some validity in that. Certainly the pacing critique is is fair. There's something a little slow about that first half, but given where it gets to, I don't mind that so much. Yeah, visual effects wise, some of it really works. Some of it is a little bit ropey, but I think there is a kind of a charm to it. You know, after you've watched these Marvel films, which just the, the visual effects are mostly flawless. You look at some mm. of the things they achieved in particularly kind of Infinity War and, and Endgame and stuff. Um, and, and compared to that, you know, one of the criticisms that was thrown about a lot with Venom was that it was like a superhero movie from 15 years ago, from 20 years ago. Mm. It was like a, a pre-X-Men attempt at a superhero movie. But I think there's something kind of pleasantly nostalgic about that. Although it is a soulless corporate cog in the superhero blockbuster machine, it doesn't always feel like one. It does feel a little bit like the punky, weird outsider with, you know, with ripped jeans, but not in a cool way. (laughs) (laughs) And I think that's what's I think that's what's charming about it. It has no pretensions of being cool. It is just weird and dorky and silly, but it also has people biting heads off. I have got issues with the look of Venom, though. He's, He's too gooey. (laughs) <laughs> it looks very moist it's just like oh and, it, and like oh, veiny and shit it's like ugh. i wrote i wrote down on my notes that i think it's from all the venoms i've seen in my life uh it's, it's the best the best looking venom and it's a, a different take certainly better well, than like the dishy <laughs> yeah. like swipe right on this venom <laughs> <laughs> it's ripped it's a very thirsty venom yeah. He's got um, all the muscles in all the right places, definitely. Yeah, he's definitely a, <laughs> he's definitely a dish. Um, but yeah, the, the Venom from the Sam Raimi Venom, I thought was was okay. Yeah, the cartoons, he's is he very very muscular, thick and big, and this kind of just kind of sets it quite nicely in between. And obviously, they have to do something about the fact that it comes from space and it's like a gooey thing that can move around on its own. So I think visually, I think how they actually physically do it's quite 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 good it's quite nice yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think there's something fun i think there's something fun about the fact as well that i guess unlike the sam raimi one this one is unencumbered from spider-man mm. let's they they not they didn't talk have... of the sam raimi one because that is just <laughs> that's an awful film and yeah yeah so because... that, that type of grace of fang staring out of a blackened <laughs> costume it's just not what i want to be thinking about at this time of night but that's the yeah and that's the beauty of it because they don't have to think about you know, making it kind of analog to Spider-Man. That meant they could do, you know, big, muscly, gooey, thick with two C's. Then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this, this podcast could easily cut horribly for us. You know, you like this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Look, after a year of lockdown, we're all we're all struggling in various ways. Yes. Because I'm not a comic reader. I don't go in with loads of expectations for these things. So I think with Venom especially, I think a lot of people have this idea of Venom from, you know, comic books in the 90s or whatever, where he needs to be this kind of punk rock anti-hero. He's a badass. He bites off people's heads. Yeah. And I never <laughs> I never had that going into the film. I was just like, I don't really, beyond Spider-Man 3, I didn't really know anything about Venom beyond the fact that everyone thought he was cool. And so watching this movie, I was, I was, you know, free of any expectations of what the character quote unquote should be. And maybe that's why yeah. I didn't mind the look as much as some people did, because yeah. I didn't have an idea of what Venom should look like. I just knew he was like, looked a little bit like Spider-Man, but a bit black and gooey. Um, <laughs> and so, I, I, you know, not having any expectations, I think, really, really helped. It, do they cop out a bit, though, in it, to be fair, in terms of just being able to push that boundary over the edge a little bit, though? Do you think it, it, it's such a, a little bit too watered down to be one or the other? That That's kind of my... That's the taste that I'm going away with after just literally finishing the film half an hour ago. Is that it could have been so much more. <laughs> well, well, it could have been something... It could, it could, Deadpool kind of thing. Or yeah, Deadpool's. exactly. Like, yeah. It, it, it could have been different, but only in the sense that anything, any film could have been different. Like... The, the fact that Logan was as good as it is doesn't invalidate like the Wolverine, which I thought was a perfectly solid Wolverine movie, even if it wasn't as good as Logan. 
Yeah. Um, I think there are, there are multiple ways to skin a cat with these comic book movies. Like the suggestion that Venom should be one thing or another. You know, the fact that there was something really natural about Logan and how it sort of felt like that's what Wolverine, quote unquote, should have been all along. That doesn't invalidate mm. how great Wolverine is in those first couple of X-Men films mm. when he's not, you know, hacking the guts out of people. And so I think I think people get too wedded to an idea of a character and go, well, if it's not that, I'm not happy with it. Like you see it, you know, sort of in one division all the time. This version of Pietro is not what I thought it was or what it was going to be. Therefore, I hate it. I hate the whole show now. It's ruined. <laughs> um, you know, we didn't get Mephisto did show up. So I hate it now. One division was a waste of time. And, and I think particularly with comic book movies, I think we get too caught up in what we think they should be. And so we don't allow ourselves to just enjoy what they are, if that makes any degree of sense. I think that's my where I kind of sit with, with Venom, that, you know, does it push things as far as it could have done? No, it certainly doesn't. You know, it's amazing what you can get away with if you just don't show any splatter. Yeah. Like if, if Venom was exactly the same, but there was a little bit of arterial spray CGI did <laughs> every time he bites a head off, then it would be an 18. <laughs> like that's that's the fine margins we're working with here. Like tonally. Oh, yeah. It's, quite, it's literally it like quite one adult. cut away, isn't it? Like, yeah, you know, for all absolutely. of the sort, there is various murder scenes in there. And literally, if they just didn't pan away the camera at the last moment, then it would be everywhere. There'd be flour everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. And people get het up over that. And like, it doesn't bother me that much. Like, do I like gory, violent movies? Yeah, I do. But like, am I going to invalidate a Venom movie just because it's he's not tearing out people's spines? Like, no, <laughs> not particularly. Like, I, I thought it was really fun. And it's got its own personality. I think that's the difference. If you watched it and it was really sterile and sanitised and it that made it bland, then maybe you'd go, oh, well, they've missed an opportunity here. But because yeah. what they've done is they've made, they have made it, you know, it's not as violent as it could have been or whatever. It's not swearing or all that stuff, but they've imbued it with so much silliness and so much personality and so much sense of fun. Like that Woody Harrelson post credits cameo is camp as shit. And it's great. Like I remember watching it because I'd forgotten because they announced Woody Harrelson was cast in it ages before it came out. He's and the eighth build he... character in the film. By the yeah, way. yeah. And I'd forgotten how, that he was supposed to be in it. This. <laughs> yeah, forgotten that he was supposed to be in it. And so when the post credit scene came and he turned up, I was like, oh, this is this is on. And then when he, because he, he does, he knows what he's doing because he's wearing that ridiculous, stupid wig. <laughs> that's like Bob, right? That's what he looks like. Yeah, he's wearing that terrible sideshow Bob wig. And then when he does the line, he says, there's going to be carnage. He almost does a little pause and like a smirk <laughs> before he says carnage. <laughs> as if he knows that you're going to like shout it from the audience <laughs> he needs a ting wink then he ting. yeah it, that's exactly it exactly it and i just love that energy that the film's got that it does stupid things like that and just lets you enjoy it like that the turd in the wind monologue which was in every trailer for the film and they make you wait until the final scene for it yeah. and so by the time <laughs> they do it you're just ready for it <laughs> Um, I just worry that it's going to run out. People would have lost some of the appetite they may have had for Woody Harrison's carnage because of the just the, the sheer amount of time that's elapsed. Uh, you know, it's in it now. Yeah, and also everything's been put back by you know twelve months or more. We we, we we've been starved of apart from with that we have one division and obviously now the Winter Soldier in, uh, is coming out on 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 Disney and you know that's going to give us a little bit of a taste of what's going on. But I think we're behind by two or three movies, aren't we? In terms of the all MCU, it, all it takes is a great trailer and that will win everyone back over. I don't think with the 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 Venom verse quote unquote, I don't think the connective tissue is necessarily that strong. I think yeah. they sort of just exist. As, as their own things. And so the, the chronology doesn't matter. Um, I think there's a little bit, and I hope this is going to be the case, of like a Mamma Mia effect. Stay with mm. me. Um, <laughs> where, when the first Mamma Mia came out, it didn't get the greatest critical reception ever. People thought it was a bit silly. But then when Mamma Mia 2 came out, everyone had built like 10 years of affection for Mamma Mia, especially after how well it did at the box office when it just broke records and was ridiculous. And everyone's mum got it on DVD for that Christmas. And, but in the like, I don't know how long, like seven, eight, nine years between the two Mamma Mia films, everyone had sort of built like a, 
such an affection for it that when the sequel came out, all of the reviews were like four and five stars for Mamma Mia 2. Yeah. Because people were just ready to accept the silliness that they kind of missed the first time around. And so it wouldn't surprise me if Venom 2 gets some very kind reviews. Like, it's obviously, it's not going to be a five-star masterpiece, is it? But I think it might get the, you know, the, the, the positive three and the four-star reviews that it didn't get last time. And I think it deserved. And I'm hope, hopeful that people will go back and they'll rewatch Venom and go, actually, I was a bit grumpy about this first time. <laughs> and watched on its own merits. It's it's a joy. I think it's a, such a hoot. It's a hoot, least, this movie. At least we can go back and call it, or it could be called Venom 2, Here We Go Again. Like, <laughs> set in Greece, Venom Point is Long Lost Lover. <laughs> yeah, it'd be, be great. Perfect. Oh, Look God. who his dad is. Um, That's it. You get, you get three symbiotes come down. We have to find out which one's Venom's dad. It'd be great. <laughs> and Cher can pop up at the end as well and do a song. Yeah, exactly. And there you've got your oh. stage version. Yeah. Perfect. There you, you go. The Cher singing, singing Fernando to Venom. <laughs> <laughs> a str- a straddling a, a large cannon. Just one more thing before we let Tom give us his final thoughts is that um, this is this is the kind of film that I would continue to watch if I stumbled in from the pub and it's the pub test. Uh, you know, you, if you stick on ITV2 late at night and, yes. and it's not Hot Fuzz or Shaun of the Dead and this was on, then you, you're more likely, or I'm likely, just to leave it there uh, and uh, just enjoy the silliness with a with a can uh, from the fridge yep. and just, just to enjoy it for what it is. Um, Tom, what are your final thoughts on Venom before we bid you adieu into the night like a big black throbbing uh, thing? <laughs> well... Um... <laughs> I mean, I, I, I just love Venom. And the thing I really like is every time I say that I like Venom, at least one other person sort of crawls sheepishly out of the woodwork to say, actually, I kind of like Venom too. I remember <laughs> when I first saw it, it honestly, it felt like swimming against the tide. It really did mm. because the, the, the consensus was so strong and so viscerally against this movie. And so it makes me appreciate. And, and so I always love it when I see like an occasional tweet, someone saying, oh, I've just watched Venom and I, I really liked it. And I don't understand why everyone was so mean to it. And I, I find myself thinking that these are my people. And, and so I do sort of see myself as the kind of unofficial leader of the Venom fan club. Any kind of comic book character like this, people have such a strong relationship with it because they love the comic books and that's great. But it's this the fact that they can't let that go when someone else wants to sort of you know take ownership of it and tom hardy he 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 loves venom him him and his son really love venom as as a comic book character and that's one of the reasons why he did the project and so you know they're fans too and it's coming from a fan it's in the same way that ryan reynolds you know got deadpool made there's a sort of similar energy here i mean not quite as Tom Hardy's not quite as creatively involved as, as Ryan Reynolds was, but there's some of that energy. And I just think it's such a silly and enjoyable and, you know, it, it's as lighthearted as a movie about biting heads off can possibly be. <laughs> and I just adore that about it. I'm honestly, I, every time I watch it, I get a new appreciation for it. I think it's really, really good. It has its flaws, of course, and we've talked about them. But Tom Hardy commits so much and the film commits so much that I think it kind of covers a multitude of sins. And I will be there the first opportunity I get to watch Venom, colon, Let There Be Carnage, because I don't know if I've ever been more ready for a movie in my life. Uh, Tom, you you valiantly defended Venom and you you didn't really need (laughs) to. Uh, We were both on board with you from the very beginning since you pitched it to us. To the choir. Yeah. So again... Absolute pleasure to speak to you. and Thank you for defending the honour. Th- th- there's no way the movie is going to be staying in the bunker. It's being shot up the tube as we speak. Uh, up it goes uh, to land on the, the, the DVD shelves of the masses. And uh, where can we find you uh, online, Tom? Where can we find your bits and pieces? <laughs> um, you can find... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm oh, just going to let that the places, I imagine I'm <laughs> really so gonna, yeah, just going to just going to let that sit there um, yeah. so yes you can you can find all of my work all of my stuff um, I, I will shamelessly promote it on Twitter I am at Tom J Beasley um, yeah if you go there you'll find all of my stuff all of my reviews my articles my incredibly niche podcast about the BBC naughty's drama series Waterloo Road um Ooh. 
Ooh. Yes, I know. It's 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 the most niche thing I've ever done, but somehow is kind of popular. I don't know how that works, but um, but I'm cool with it. So yeah, all of that stuff um, on my Twitter. That is the place to find me. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. And just a quick one from us. If you've enjoyed the podcast and you haven't yet left a review, please do so. It really helps. And you can find us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Just search for the Movie Bunker podcast. And we've got a fantastic website. Thanks to Matt. And the address is? Uh, (laughs) www.moviebunkerpodcast.com. Yes, easy bit for you to remember. Just in case you didn't think it was a www dot. Also, yeah. if you if you want to find uh, financially support us, you can buy us that virtual coffee. Uh, just head to the Ko-Fi page in the show notes. Tom, again, thanks ever so much for coming on, and uh, hopefully we'll have you back for Venom Two, or not? Hopefully, because hopefully it'll be it'll be good. But there you go. Uh, any excuse, any excuse. <laughs> I, I'm prepared to personally review bomb its Rotten Tomato score if it means I can talk about it on more podcasts. <laughs> Oh. Tom two for two for getting things out of the, the uh out of the bunker. So yeah, we appreciate this now, so. Cheers, Tom. Thanks a lot. Uh, should we just do a collective bye? So it sounds like we've actually said goodbye. See you later. <laughs> bye. bye.